Hey guys, it's Greg. How's it going? Today we're going to look at the bias variance trade-off, or also underfitting versus overfitting. I'll explain all of those ideas and terminologies. So I do have Python code shown in this video, but don't worry if you don't care about it. I'm not going to explain or talk about it. If you do want the notebook, I have that available in the video description. So moving on. We have a scatter plot, which has an unlabeled x variable and an unlabeled y variable. I'm purposely not showing any particular variables because as long as we see a trend like this, well, there seems to be a recognizable pattern between the X and the Y. Given an X, we should be able to get a reasonable prediction as to Y by following this trend. Starting off with a linear model, well, we can draw a line through the data, and that doesn't seem to fit it all too well. You know, here there's so many under it and nothing over it. Here there's so many over it, over it here as well. This is not a terrible model, but it looks like something better would be a curve through it. So this model has an error of 363 using the root mean squared error and evaluating the error across different problems and, you know, different data sets doesn't really mean much. It means much to compare across, you know, the same set of variables using like a train set versus a test set. We'll look at test in a little bit, as well as different models on the same data set exactly. So on this same training set, it's the training set because we trained a model on it and we're evaluating the performance on that train set. Using that same set, we are going to make a different model which allows some flexibility. It allows some curvature into it, and rightfully so, we get a root mean squared error of much less, 203, as compared to 363. If we were to go one step further and allow a very jerky, flexible model, which is actually allowed to go through pretty much every single data point here, that gets essentially a root mean squared error of zero. Well, this is going to be what we call overfit. As we'll see, it is just following it too closely. The real trend is going up in a smooth curve up like this, not following the noise or randomness that we have here. You know, it's bouncing around here. The true trend is actually the line up like this, not following the noise or the randomness that's bouncing up and down like this. So we will now look at the test set. So this is what we will use to evaluate the performance of our models. Knowing the error on the test set is very useful to us because it allows us to test the generalizability of our models. And so we want one that, you know, does well on the training set and well on the test set. In fact, we mostly only really care about its performance on the test set, although we often use the training set as well. So let's take a look. On the test set, well, we get an error of 373 for the linear model. Note that that's pretty similar as to what it got on the training set. 373 compared to 362, they're pretty similar. It's because it drew a line through it, and as long as the data looks roughly similar like this, well, then it's not going to be all that different. Sorry for the jump there. Let's now look at the test set on the second model. So it still goes up like this, and the root mean squared error is up to 250 as compared to, well, it got 200 before. So it's a little bit worse. It's definitely worse, but it is still better than the linear model did on the test set. Much better. It got 373 on the test set, and the nonlinear model, the curved one here, it got a much better 250. Now, what about the final model, the very jerky one? Well, it has a root mean squared error of 290 on the test set. So which model is preferred? It's the one that has the least error on the test set. That's usually the criterion of interest. And so that is the smoothed curve model, 250 as compared to 290. So why did this model do so bad? Well, it's so jerky around like this, and it learned all of the noise or randomness in the training set. And so here, you know, instead of just drawing like a smooth curve in the middle here, it learned too much to go up here. And actually the randomness now brought it a little bit down. And so it would have been better if it just drew a curve through the middle instead of jumping up and down like it saw on the training set. The reason the linear model did bad well, taking a look at that, sorry for the movement here, it just drew a line through the training set, and so it still gets a bad error here. It didn't follow the trend in the training set, and it still doesn't follow it now. If it doesn't follow the trend in the training set, then it's not going to do well on a test set. 
Similarly, with the very, very jerky model here, if it really, really, really closely fits the training set, it captures every single, not pattern, but just every single movement in the data set. If it gets a very, very, very small error like this, that means it's following the randomness and there'd be a better model that just went and followed the actual pattern in the data, not the random or noise. If you find a model that smoothly follows the curve up like this, like we did with the red model here. This one just follows a pretty good curve. You know, there might be a better model, but it does a pretty good job of smoothly going up the data. And so 250 on the test set, 290 on the test set here, and worse of all, 373 on the test set there. So our preferred model is this smooth one that follows the curve like this. The terminology associated with this is that this model has roughly a low variance and a low bias. So to demonstrate high bias, well, a linear model generally has high bias. Unless the data actually was linear, then it would be a good model. But since it's non-linear like this, the actual trend is a curve up like this, the linear model has what we call high bias. And what we mean by that is really the ability to fit the training set well. If we go and hit the data you know, pretty closely, well, then we're going to have a low bias. So what does that mean? Well, on our final model here, this one has a very, very low bias because it's able to, actually, it looks better on the training set. If we look at that model on the training set, well, you can see it has a very, very low bias here. It's able to hit pretty much every data point. But it has what we call a high variance. As in, since it's so jerky around like this, well, it's learned a very, very specific rule here as opposed to just a smooth trend, which we want. So if we see it on the test set, well, that model does, you know, a lot worse compared to the smooth trend model. It has a high variance. A high variance essentially means change. And so if you see a high error here, but a low error, when we saw it on the training set, there is such a massive difference between the error of this model on the training set and the error of this model on the test set. There is a big variance, you could say. So this model has a high variance. It's very jerky around like this, learning the original, not pattern, but the randomness or noise in it. And so, yes, it had a low bias because in the training set, it was allowed to wrap itself around pretty much every point but it has too high a variance. It's too jerky around like this and doesn't capture the smooth trend. We are searching this model right here. It has a bit of a bias. So if we look at it on the training set of data, well, yeah, it's not actually following each of the points, but that's okay. It's generally following the smooth curve. So we're okay with that. And it doesn't have too much variance. It's not bouncing around so crazy that it has to capture the point each time. It is able to have a good balance of bias and variance, not too much bias, not too much variance. So we actually like this model quite a bit. And we'll see these reflections in the error most of the time. Sometimes it doesn't always exactly match the theory, but in general, you'll see that this model here, which smoothly follows the curve, well, it has the lowest error on the test set. Okay, so if you see the lowest error of any model in the test set, well, that's the smooth curved one like this. So those were the bias and variance terms. Using the underfit and overfit one, well, the linear model. This one underfits the data. It doesn't capture the trend, and so we'd say it underfits. This model here, the smooth curve one, we'd say that pretty much properly fits. That's ideal. And this model here, we'd say this overfits, okay? It's fitting way too close to the data. That means it's getting way too low a bias and it's gonna have a high variance. So if you have a high variance, well, then you will tend to overfit. If you have a high bias, well, then you will tend to underfit. And if you have a decent level of bias and variance, not too much bias and not too much variance, that is ideal and it is going to properly fit. I hope that helped and have a great day, guys.